Thanks, Mateo. Um, it's great to see everybody here. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's a great honor to get to introduce <laughs> Charles Marone, president of Strong Towns. Um, and he has written a new book. All his other books are great. So I encourage you to pre-order this one. It will be out in nine days. Um, it's called Confessions of a Recovering Engineer, Transportation for a Strong Town. Um, so it's a real honor for me to get to introduce Chuck. I think it was maybe 2013 um, when Matt Lewis was planning director down in San Marcos and he had Chuck come and a bunch of us uh, carpooled down to San Marcos to see this guy from Minnesota that I'd never heard of and um, I just I wanted to share that I was totally blown away. If you haven't heard this talk about you haven't seen him speak, you're in for a real treat. It really connected a lot of thoughts for me. It was as a planner, um, most of my life, it was a real aha moment for me. And I think for a lot of people um, from seeing you in Central Texas, because I think we all swamped him at the end of the presentation and begged him to drive up to Austin the next day and have lunch with us so we could continue talking. And he's come to Austin a bunch of different times since then and it's really changed the way we think about a lot of things, including transportation. So, I was telling him earlier, he taught me what a screw is, what a clear zone is, what a diver thing diamond is, um, and all those things are really important in transportation and understanding how we have a system of building a transportation system that really doesn't support humans in a lot of ways. That's very much designed around commerce. So, with that, I'll let you hear the minute of the hour. And Chuck Brown, please join me. Welcome. Um, thanks for being here tonight, too. This is really fantastic. Um, <laughs> I, before I get started, I should say a, a few uh, thank yous. First of all, to Hayden and Sinclair and Abby, uh, who have been a big part of uh, my numerous trips to Austin and big supporters of Strong Towns and everything that we've been doing. Uh, I owe a sincere debt of gratitude to all of them. I also want to point out a couple people in the audience. Um, Andrew Burleson, right here, uh, is our board chair. This is actually my boss. Uh, he's here tonight to check up on me. No, he, he lives in Austin amongst all of you good people. And so he uh, was able to pick me up at the airport and uh, uh, is going to be bringing me to the airport tomorrow and is here tonight. Also, uh, those of you who don't know Active Towns, uh, John Zimmerman in the back corner back there. Uh, hello to John's audience online too. John's recording this and streaming thanks to uh, 21st century technology. Uh, all of you have great seats up there, by the way. Um, and then Sheena uh, is on our staff. If you, uh, you, she's the one percent strong downs that you probably don't know because she works completely behind the scenes, but everything that is awesome is a result of Sheena. Uh, she fixes all my writing, uh, she fixes all my mistakes, and so when things turn out well, it's definitely because of her. So, And she lives here among you as well. Um, I have to say, I, I'm, I'm embarking on this book tour, and uh, we, we got this call to do this thing today with the Real Estate Council, is that what they're called? Uh, at lunch. By the way, that went awesome. Uh, your, your builders and developers got an earful today, and I tried to go. I tried to go easy on them, but I tried to also be a little bit like. There were a couple times where you had like 150 people in the room, and there was not. They were eating. There was not a sound. Uh, so it it really yeah. I felt I went out of there going that worked really well. Um, but uh, tonight, th this is uh, amongst friends. CNU, I I'm a member of CNU. Uh, I have been for a long time. Andrew and I met at CNU. And I kind of feel like when I come here and I do a CNU event, it's like a more relaxed, chill event among friends. And so I was a little bit intimidated uh, when they gave me the title of this, which is like the, the intersection of everything. <laughs> how do you talk? How do you how do you talk about the intersection of everything? So, <laughs> I, I I I kind of opted to say I, I think there's two. I'm going to give you the two takeaways right up front, and then we're going to go through a, a bunch of stuff that I, I I think is really important to share, but might seem a little bit random. And then we're going to go back to these two points. Here, here's the two. Uh, you need to stop building highway lanes. 
period. Like, just period. You just stop building highway lanes, just like done. Forget, like, we're, we're done with that. Uh, and then we start, can you start building uh, neighborhoods? Uh, Complete neighborhoods, in incrementally thickening up our places. And if you keep those two thoughts uh, as kind of like the centerpiece of this conversation, uh, all of this is going to hopefully converge on everything. Uh, at the end of World War II, uh, we had this uh, conundrum. We had gone through the Great Depression, uh, this kind of unknown uh, dislocation in our economy. It, it's interesting to note about the Depression that at the time, and even today, no one really can explain why the Great Depression happened. You can read economists that will have like theories, and then you'll say, like, that is really smart. And then you'll read another economist with a completely opposite theory, and you go, well, that, that's really smart too. There's no consensus on what directly caused the Great Depression. It was kind of a breakdown of a complex economy. Even more important, nobody knew how to get out of the Depression. The entire New Deal project was this project of trying a bunch of different things to see what would work. Uh, and, and the only thing that worked, and this is kind of the, the highlight that we're taught in our high school civics class, uh, what got us out of the Depression was World War II, right? World War II got us out of the Depression. And you're like, yeah, OK, that's economic orthodoxy. Um, start a global war, send millions of people off to die, uh, put a bunch of people to work um, building ships and bombs and munitions, and uh, you know, ration butter, ration bread, ration gas, and you've got, yay, economic growth. Um, that doesn't sound like prosperity, right? And no one wanted to keep this war going on just for the idea of keeping the economy going. And so there was a, an understanding that as the war was winding down, uh, there was going to be some type of economic dislocation. In fact, this is just a quote from Paul Samuelson, one of the uh, top economic advisors for FDR. He said, you know, were the war to end, suddenly there'd be this uh, great period of uh, unemployment and industrial dislocation. Uh, basically, if we brought all these troops home, we closed down all these industries that were building stuff for war, we were just gonna go right back to 1932. Right, there's nothing different about our economy that would keep it from going back into depression. Uh, of course, we can look back in history and we know that's not what happened, right? Um, what happened was, was this, right? We, 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 we were at the, end of the world, at the end of the World War, we were the only industrial economy unimpacted by the war, you know, not decimated by bombs and, and, and stuff. We literally had the gold, right? We were the world's reserve currency. Uh, everybody else was bankrupt. We had all the money. We were pumping more oil out of the ground than Saudi Arabia. Uh, we had tons of cheap fuel. We had a culture united around common enemies, right? There's, there's, there's nothing that unites people than this kind of shared struggle. And we took all of this capital and we put it to work building a new version of America a version of America that would keep us out of the Great Depression. And here's the thing. It worked, right? Uh, we look back today. And we still nostalgize those couple of decades after World War II for the amount of growth we experienced, the, uh, the overall prosperity, the idea of you know, the, the American dream, this kind of shared concept of, of growing and expanding prosperity. Uh, those lessons are with us today in, in every dimension of society. This was a sharp divergence from the way we had built cities for thousands of years. I, those of you that have been to my CNU events before, it's impossible for me not to show these, these three photos. Uh, real quickly, go through them. This is my hometown of Brainerd back in 1871. And I show this not because Brainerd is this amazing place, but because if we were to go take a snapshot of the earliest days of Austin, or the earliest days of Dallas or Fort Worth, or even you know any, any, any town that was built really prior to the Great Depression, their very first iteration always looked like this. It was a, a little bit of hopes and dreams about the future, these little pop-up shacks, uh, a collection of people trying to make something out of nothing. And in the ones that were successful, what you would see is this very powerful mechanism, and I, I'm gonna explain this because it's the powerful mechanism we need to get back. The idea that uh, as cities grew and as more people moved to a place, the actual physical land would become more valuable. The land would become more valuable because more people were there and more people wanted to be there. 
If you look at rising land values in a situation like this, you have these little pop-up sheds. I mean, there was nothing there. And so you think about a decade or two of these pop-up shacks, they would start to fall apart. They would start to deteriorate. You have this combination of rising land values and structures falling apart, and you get what is a natural redevelopment pressure that would produce a street like this. This is the exact same street just 40 years later. I'm sorry, that one's 30 years later. More and more people would move to this place. It would become more of a place, more active. The city would grow outward incrementally, upward incrementally, continue to thicken up. That rising land values of having that growth, uh, along with these structures ultimately decaying as well, created this natural redevelopment pressure where people would buy these, tear them down, and then you get a street like this. Th this is the same exact street 40 years later. And so it is a natural, uh, you can think of this as like an ecosystem renewing itself over time. As the city would continue to grow in multiple dimensions, uh, it would renew itself, thickening up and becoming more of a place, providing opportunities on the edge, you can think of, for like startup, right? Uh, these were the, you know, it, 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 when, we, when we start at this place and we go to here, if you were to go a couple blocks off of this in any direction, you were gonna see buildings that looked a lot like this. By the time you get to this point here, if you were gonna go a couple blocks in any direction on here, you would see buildings that look like this, and if you went a couple blocks more, you'd see buildings that look like this. Think of this as an ecosystem, where no matter where you were on like the, the class structure or the hierarchy of a city or, or, or your personal journey through life, you can come to a place like this, find a place to get, to get started, and through your efforts, collectively with everyone else around you, actually build something of value. You could start with nothing and end up with something. That was not a perfect thing. It, it, it didn't work out for everybody. I'm not trying to pretend this is a utopia. These were hard places in many ways. But the, the structure was there for renewal. And that's important because a, a lot of that is what we're missing today. Here's what the same street looks like right now. And you can get a snapshot of you know a city in distress and a city in decline but I think it's important, especially for the, con you know, the, the, the conversation we have here in Austin, to recognize that uh, you know, this is a self-imposed, something we did to ourselves. In my town, uh, we're, we, we, we tend to lead the state in unemployment. And by lead the state, I don't mean best, I mean highest, like worst. We tend to struggle. My hometown is not very, it's very poor. I was just going to say not very wealthy. I can, I can, I'm not being rude to my neighbors to say it's, we're a poor town. It's a, it's a rather poor place, um, especially the city itself. The wealthy people tend to live out on the lakes around the city. Um, you don't have a lot of this here. You have some of it, but not much. And the reason it looks different here is because you have all this capital flowing in that is essentially like covered up some of this. But it's the same like static uh, process that has created this. And that's what I want to talk about here. I, I want you to see what this looks like. Um, this is a map of Fresno. I actually got, we were talking about Joe. I got this map from Joe. These from Joe Minicozzi put these together. I use Fresno because we've got really good maps of Fresno. But you're going to see, like, this is Austin. This is my hometown. This is really every city in the U.S. I want to show you the the city limits over time. Uh, this is 1897, so this little yellow area here was the city limits of Fresno in 1897. Watch as we go through that pre-World War II uh, pattern of development, that incrementally up, incrementally out, incrementally more intense, that renewing pattern of growth. Watch how the city's boundaries change. 1909, 1922, the Great Depression now, and now we're at the end of World War II. Now, in order to meet kind of these macroeconomic goals, in order to keep us out of the, uh, you know, get us out of the Great Depression, keep our economy moving, uh, provide all this economic growth and opportunity at the macro level, what we do is we turn our cities into kinetic growth machines. We make them into engines of economic growth. In a sense, uh, it's an engine of growth you just add capital, you add infrastructure spending, you add like a few key components, you know, subsidies and what have you, and you get growth. So here, uh, end of World War II, now, uh, 1950s, 
1970, here's 1983, here's 1995, and, and, and here we get to 2010. Uh, you look at a city like mine, for example, uh, at the end of World War II, the population of Brainerd was 13,500 people. Today it's 13,500 people, it, it's 10 times the size, 10 times the area. In Austin, you have a, a, obviously a very similar thing, right? You have this massive horizontal development pattern that has become like the standard part of how you operate. And that pattern is enabled by uh, the large infrastructure expenditures, the highways, uh, the subsidies that you've done for sewer and water. Uh, it is enabled by the large amounts of capital that have been pumped into housing and into uh, the, the residential construction industry. In fact, when we look at things like uh, the macroeconomic situation, what we see is that as time has gone on, it has required more and more energy to keep this kinetic machine running. To keep this kinetic growth machine running at the local level, it's required from the top down more and more inputs of energy. Th this is just a, a, a graph of interest rates uh, since 1982. And does anyone know what like the Federal Reserve Fed funds rate is right now? We're debating this. Yeah, nada, zero, zero. Um, someone asked me once, what is a, um, oh, I can't remember the term. It's not important. Uh, basically, we have free money right now. And if you don't have to pay any interest on your debt uh, and you can renew that debt kind of indefinitely, that's just a grant, right? Like that's, that's, not, that's not a loan anymore, right? And so we're in this very weird situation where in order to keep this going, we've lowered rates, brought them up, lowered rates, brought them up, lowered rates, brought them up. And from a, a, a macroeconomic standpoint, uh, we've done everything we can to kind of juice this market, uh, to keep this growth going. Uh, part of that has created this, and I, 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 I wanted to include this because I, I think there's an important housing story here that connects to the transportation story that is is a general one for the U.S., but very specific for you, because you are in the uh, frenetic, crazy, like eye of the storm in terms of housing and the housing market and this whole effect. And a lot of times we talk about the supply and demand, but th th this is a graph of, this is the Case-Shiller Index over time, starting at the end of the 1800s. And what the Case-Shiller Index does is it looks at the basically the capacity that people have to pay and relates that to housing prices. So as wages go up, you can pay more for a home. And so when wages go up across the board in general, home prices tend to go up. For those of you that are not math inclined, if you divide one by the other and both numbers are going up, the result is kind of flat. And so the Case-Shiller Index suggests that housing should be rather flat over time. And in fact, you see that, you know, before World War I, there's some volatility in the marketplace, no doubt. Housing used to be much more volatile uh, than it is today. Uh, in World War I, prices went way down. They stayed down to the end of World War II through the Great Depression. Then we had the post-war boom and this kind of very stable period of time in housing prices. This is that American dream, panacea, the great growth, the kinetic growth machine, the early days. You have a boom in the 80s, a boom in the 90s, and then we have this that ended in 2008. Um, I was here a couple years after when, when that went like this. I was here for the first time. And it's fascinating because there's two places in the country where they talk about this in this certain way, uh, Texas and California. Everywhere else in the country, they, they talk about you know uh, growth and development and bubbles and booms. Every, when I'm in Texas and when I'm in California, I always hear this sense of like, the growth is never going to end. There's an endless number of people that want to be here. It is like out to infinity. It will never end and therefore price will always go up because there's just no end. And it's interesting because I was here in 2010, 2011. I was in California that same period of time. And people there were almost, that, that like religious belief that they had was being challenged and they were kind of having to face it and then bam, it went away and, and, and we uh, you know, continued on. Uh, I still get it today. I met with your mayor a few years ago and we were having these conversations and talking strong towns and 
the last thing he said to me was that, you know, Austin's always going to grow. Like there's always tons of people moving here. And, and let, me, let me interpret that for you, not just from your mayor, but from everybody I hear it from. Uh, growth covers up all your mistakes. So you can be sloppy, you could screw a lot of things up, but if there's a whole bunch of new people coming in flooding you with money, eh, you know, it doesn't matter that much. Okay, look at this. Here's what happened after 2008, right? And we're all familiar with this, right? What, less, what we're less familiar with is what happened afterwards, right? So here we're zooming in on the end of, this is the end of the 80s, that little bubble right here, and then another little bubble right here, and then you've got the 2008 housing, right? Here's the peak right here. I, I wanna do a little exercise with you just to kind of help you mentally get your mind around where we're at right now today. So we call this the housing bubble, right? Everybody's with me? Housing bubble. Okay, here's what's happened subsequent. What do we call this? The housing recovery. <laughs> do, do, you, do you see what's going on here? Right? So, so we're fine saying, like, right here, damn, that was crazy. <laughs> that was nuts. Like, what were we thinking? <laughs> crazy bubble. Oh, my gosh. Um, what is this? That's the one we're living through now. And actually, this goes till 2018. We know what's happened since this, right? It's just gone up here, right? We, we, we can always like rationalize to ourselves in the moment, in the period of time, what's going on. And when we look back, we can say, yeah, that was a bubble. We were nuts then. But we're in our right minds now, right? Like all this makes sense now. All this is is prudent and good and there's reasons for it and we can justify it and, and maybe there is maybe housing will continue to go like that forever and it will be just fine um, I don't know you, you have a massive problem here in in Austin one that is uh, you know kind of unprecedented certainly in the middle of the country uh, but really comparable only to some you know freak markets in California uh, what you've created here is really a monster. And when we go back to that incremental development pattern, this is what I told your uh, real estate people today, what, what we've created is a situation where in order to respond to this, uh, we've given two options in the marketplace. Uh, one is, uh, you know, hyper out. So let's, let's, let's build more hyper out. And the other one is, I, I think, you know, we could throw around the word gentrification, uh, but, but re really what it is is a hyper up, a hyper up option. And think about it like a pressure cooker, right? Like you've constrained everything so much that when it goes, it, it blows out. So everything's constrained, and then when it goes up, it's 12 stories. Everything's constrained, when it goes out, it's 1,000 units out on the edge. Um, it's these massive, massive surges as opposed to that kind of redevelopment. He, here's the corresponding thing I want to go along with this. This is a, a population pyramid. I, I'm an engineer, I apologize for that. Um, I like charts and graphs, they make sense to me. For those of you that this doesn't make sense, uh, I realize we're in 2021, play along with me. Uh, Men, women, or women, men, I think is what it is. No, men, women, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Uh, age, zero to 100, uh, percent of the population. So what you're seeing here is a, a big gap, or a big group of baby boomers and a big group of millennials in here. This is where I'm at. I'm in one of those weird Xers who get left behind. Um, here's the interesting thing. This group here has to buy homes over the next you know, decade or two from this group here. What do we know about that group on the bottom? It, they don't have any money, <laughs> right? Like they're broke. They don't have any money. What do we know about housing prices right now? They're ridiculously high. How do people with no money buy way, way overinflated housing. 
How do they do that? Uh, I'll give you one little thing that I think is coming. I think we're going to have 50-year mortgages very soon. I think in the next few years, you will have 50-year mortgages. And, and you might wind up with 60 or 75-year mortgages. Because what do you do when you can't afford the payments? You spread them out over a longer period of time. We already did the other stuff, right? Like, what do you do when you can't afford the payment? You lower the interest rate. Well, I showed you what they did to interest rates, right? What do you do when you can't afford the payment then? Well, you have the Federal Reserve buy every mortgage. Our Federal Reserve prints money and buys every single mortgage that's originated in this country, goes straight to them. They buy it, and that keeps mortgage rates down. It creates an automatic market so any bank can originate any loan, and as long as it qualifies, it will go onto a secondary market and the Federal Reserve will buy it. Zero risk. That makes the housing market really, really, really liquid. We've done that. What's next? Like, what's the next thing we do? Give people money to buy homes? We're kind of doing that a little bit today. That, that's really not a great strategy. Uh, I think what's going to come next is a 50-year mortgage. And, and, and I think you'll eventually get to, I don't know, maybe you'll get to a 100-year mortgage. Who knows? Uh, but the idea is that if we're going to keep this going and have this transaction take place, we need to burden our younger people with greater levels of debt. And the only way we can do that and have the same, you know, have them be able to quote unquote afford it is to keep them in financial purgatory longer. Does that make sense? That's, that sucks. Like that's not a good strategy, right? It might be a good strategy if you are part of this group. It's not a good strategy if you're part of this group. So let's, let's be clear about that. I, this is the last thing I'm going to have on housing, and then we're going to connect it to transportation, and then we'll have talked about everything. <laughs> um, I put this chart together a few years ago, and I thought it was obvious, and then I shared it with people, and they did that. They started taking pictures. Um, who benefits from having high housing prices? If you think about housing as like a, you know, our public policy around housing and around affordable housing, uh, what we're asking people to do is make a decision that actually goes against what their individual self-interests are. Again, I'm not saying people are bad. I own a house. Chuck, do you want housing prices to go down 50%? No, I do not. Are you going to vote for policies that have housing prices go down 50%? Probably not, right? I'm 48 years old. I own a house. I've got maybe 50, 60% equity. I really don't want to give all that up. I've worked hard to get that, right? So who benefits from housing prices being high? Well, let's put the trio of governments in here, right? Local governments uh, have their bu budget capacity expanded every year when housing prices go up. And they will say to you, like, we're not raising tax rates, but, you know, the property value went up 10% or 15% across the board, and so our revenue goes up 10, 15% with the same exact tax rates. State governments benefit by having housing prices go up. There's a wealth effect along with that. Uh, there's all kinds of investment that goes along with that. The federal government also benefits. You, you, you remember back in 2008, the absolute abject panic when the housing market just leveled off uh, and, and created this kind of cascade down. Uh, it's because we are very dependent on housing prices go up in government. Um, obviously, existing homeowners benefit, right? Banks and insurance companies benefit because there is less risk involved making loans and running insurance on properties that are appreciating in value every year. Developers benefit from prices going up. And it's always interesting to me when the developers come in and they complain about like, oh, prices are so high, it's so hard to acquire land, land prices are so high, I need all these extra units or I need all these extra things because I can't make it work. Yet the fact that prices go up on new construction, 10, 15, 20% a year, covers up all the mistakes that any developer makes. If developers had to live in a world where prices were stagnant and they weren't bailed out every year by increasing valuations, all of a sudden they would have to get very tight on all their supply chain, all of their processes. It, it would be a much different world for them. There's a huge benefit there. Obviously, land speculators, realtors, pension funds are a huge one. Okay, the, 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 there's a long list of like everybody who has a say in the process 
has direct benefit from prices going up. Who doesn't? Uh, renters? The poor. Uh, and I would include the poor to be like the unhoused or people who would like to buy a house but don't necessarily have the means to afford it in today's market. If you're setting policy for the nation, and you are, have inherited this kinetic growth machine, this machine that you just, like the fuel of it is capital and, 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 and infrastructure spending and housing subsidies, and that's what you've got, and, and, and you've inherited this machine, and everybody on the left is like, yeah. This is kind of go up, and I benefit from going up. And, and not only that, it can never go down. How do you start to create opportunities for people who are in that, you know, that, 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 that bottom group there? How do you get them into homes? I think this is the big question we struggle with, right? Let me talk transportation and let me connect these two things. So we talk about everything. Um, the basis of the kinetic growth machine from a transportation standpoint, let, let, let me say it this way. It is astounding, and if you, if you recognize this, you will see it everywhere. We define almost all of our problems in terms of transportation. Our housing problem is actually a transportation problem. And so in order to alleviate housing issues, we need to add 10 lanes to Highway 35, because that, that, that will make housing more affordable, right? Because it will allow more raw land on the edge to be developed at cheaper prices, and people can live there and commute in, and da 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 da. Uh, we tend to define all of our major problems in terms of transportation. And the reason we do that is because, you know, why do they rob the bank? Because that's where the money is. Why do you define every problem in terms of transportation? Because that's where the money is. We're about to drop, you know, how many hundreds of billions of dollars in transportation money at the federal level. If you look at our federal government, they can't agree on anything, right? Republicans, Democrats can't agree on like what time to hold a meeting. The one thing that they can agree on, broad bipartisan consensus, is that we need to spend hundreds of billions building new highways and new frontage roads and new interchanges. That's the only thing they agree on. Because that is the basis, that's the fuel of that kinetic growth machine. This is the backbone of that structure. Um, this is a little doodle. Uh, but it, it, it's describing uh, a, a thing that we all implicitly understand, this hierarchical road network. The idea that our streets go from local streets to collector streets, collector to arterial, arterial to major arterial, in, in this kind of hierarchical way. You start your day on your little local street, you drive to a collector, you take that with a bunch of other people to a bigger street, an arterial, and, and so on and so on. I want you to think about a watershed. Um, I'm going to use Minnesota terms. I don't know how you, I don't know exactly how you talk about it here, but we, we would call the very far reaches of the outer shed, like a, a brook or a creek, a stream maybe. Uh, water flows into these things and, and then comes together and flows into these small little brooks. Uh, it flows eventually into a river. The river may flow into a, a larger river, come together. Then you get a major tributary. We, we all get this, right? Like we all understand how water flows through a watershed. We also understand that when you get rain out on the periphery, if that rain is uh, persistent enough or has a long enough duration or is intense enough at one point in time, all that water will come together cumulatively and create a flood, right? This is hydrology 101. And as a civil engineer, I sat through hydrology 101 and I learned how this happened, right? For some reason though, when I leave Hydrology 101 and walk down the hall to Traffic Engineering 101, uh, we get this, not a, a river of water, but one of concrete and asphalt. And for some reason, when we get rain out on the edge, we are absolutely completely baffled by why we get a flood. We just, we don't understand. How does this keep happening? Why? Why is there massive amounts of congestion? Why, why is this overwhelm our system? And you know, while we can acknowledge that there's a little bit of money to be made in the short term from adding that stuff out on the edge, there's a massive, massive cost to all of us and to our entire system 
for having this take place in the center. How do we deal with rain in a system like this? What do we do to prevent this flood from happening? Because we're really good at this. In Hydrology 101, they teach you exactly what to do. What, what do we do? Everybody in this room knows, right? We, we, we retain the water out here. We don't allow all that water to run into here and accumulate. We slow it down. We let it sink in. We hold it back. We, we do rather prudent things in order to make that flood not as severe, not happen in the way that it does, right? We're very prudent about this. Look at this. What do we need to do here to avoid the flood? Yeah, we need to start building neighborhoods. The way you, the way you prevent this flood is you actually have an alternative to this route. You actually provide a, a different option for people here. Let, let me make this point. If we set out to create the maximum amount of congestion humanly possible, we would build our highways like this. We would build our transportation system like this. This creates the maximum amount of congestion possible at any one time. If we are going to actually deal with congestion, adding 10 more lanes adding a lane here, a lane there, putting in a new interchange, adding new frontage roads, all the stuff that we are funding at the federal level and that your state DOT is insistent has to happen over and over and over. Instead of doing that, which is a fruitless exercise, what we need to do is provide people alternatives, alternatives to getting in their car. What does that look like? Go back a few minutes ago when we were talking about what? Neighborhoods that renew themselves, neighborhoods that thicken up, neighborhoods that add to their capacity over time, right? We have chosen here in Austin, and as has you know most cities around the country, to say, once we build a neighborhood, it's done. It, it's a little bit like God rests on the seventh day. Once we build a neighborhood, we just rest, it's over. It's done, you know, there will be no changes here, world without end, right? It's over. We build all at once to a finished state. And understand what that does to your neighborhoods. What it does is that at one point, a neighborhood is brand new. And we'll go out and we'll build 40 homes all within a couple years of each other. Or maybe we'll build 200 homes, or maybe we'll build 1,000 homes, depending on the scale of the developer. And they're all built and they all look good and the, the realtors can go out and sell them and it's the shiny and new place and all that infrastructure is brand new and it's rolled into the price of the mortgage and the city's getting all this new tax revenue and all the people out there are shiny, happy people. You know, it's all working out great. And 25 years later, everybody's roof fails at the same time. Everybody's sidewalk goes bad at the exact same time. Everybody's appliances fail at the same time because all the homes were built simultaneous. They all have the same lifespan. And so all at once, an entire neighborhood goes into decline, broad decline. What happens then? Well, the affluent people move on. They probably moved on before you got to that point, right? Because they're, you know, they have the mechanism to move, so they, they move somewhere else. Everybody else tries to hang on as best they can and you try to hang on through another generation, the city will go out and try to patch up the road, take on some debt, raise your taxes, hope there's new growth out on the edge that gives them more money to do this. We'll try to piece things together and make it all work. But you get to a point where the only option you have in a neighborhood like this is failure. Failure or, in Austin, if you pump enough money into the neighborhood, you get that explosion. You either get a hyper-vertical or you get like a, a, a point gentrification. You get the, you get the, the, the cheap rundown house that's selling for a, a bizarre amount of money purchased and then built into the, the McMansion, you know, the, like the new power home, right? This is the antithesis of the way cities historically have evolved and changed. And you have created, through this congestion system, uh, basically an approach that says, we are not going to 
retain. We are not going to build neighborhoods. We're going to continue to add more lanes. And what I'm suggesting is not only do we all recognize that as fruitless, but the, we can, we can, we can uh, address two problems simultaneously by a shift in approach. We can both solve or at least address the transportation congestion issue by providing people alternatives, and we can address the housing issue by providing people alternatives. Do you see how powerful this is? Let's keep going. Uh, in the book that's coming out next week, uh, and, and throughout Strong Towns, we talk about the difference between a road and a street. And I'm going to encourage you to use this language because it is deeply subversive language. Uh, engineers have a difficult time, and transportation professionals, of discerning what is a road and what is a street. A road is a, a high-speed connection between two places. A street is a platform, a framework for building wealth within a place. And sometimes people say, Chuck, why does it have to be wealth? Why can't you just talk about you know, shiny, happy people? Why does it have to be? Because remember, we're replacing a kinetic growth machine, right? The kinetic growth machine generates macro growth at the expense of local economies. What we need to do is actually shore up our local finances. And a street is the way we do that. So when we talk about transportation at the local level, let's make sure we're always discerning between a road and a street. Honest to God, this is what the manual on uniform traffic control devices says. <laughs> if you look up in the engineering manual what the definition of a street is, it does say C highway. And what, what happens then is that when we're thinking about how do we thicken up our neighborhoods, what we have is we have not only a housing regulatory approach that, is the, that, that, that tries to thwart that, but we actually have a local engineering approach with our streets that tries to thwart that as well. Part of this is the misapplication of forgiving design. Forgiving design is a genius concept developed at, you know, in the early automobile days to address problems that they were having with basically cart paths being converted into high capacity roadways. If you have an old cart path and you run across a gully or a, a big rock or a big tree, you would just go around it, right? There's no sense in removing that. You're just on a horse and buggy. But if you've got a high performance vehicle and a high performance roadway, what we found in the early automobile days was that people were getting killed. In, in, the carnage was astounding. And so engineers came with an, up with an approach, a genius approach, really, to deal with that. They said, OK, take a two-lane roadway. We know that uh, from time to time, people are going to uh, veer in the roadway. They're, they're, they're going to drift a little bit. And we want to make sure that if they drift a little bit, for whatever reason, they don't go across the lane and hit an oncoming vehicle. So we're going to widen out the lanes. We also know that sometimes uh, drivers will actually leave the, you know, go off the edge of the driving lane. Maybe they get a flat tire. Maybe there's something in the roadway. Maybe they just, you know, look down and, and, and veer a little bit. We want to make sure they don't get sucked off the edge of the road. We want to keep them on the road surface. Uh, that's going to be safe. So let's add a, a recovery area on the side. And then we know that sometimes drivers, despite the best intentions, are going to go off the roadway. They're going to go off the roadway with lots of kinetic energy and force. We want to dissipate that before they run into something that is not going to move. And so let's create a broad clear zone. And now you have forgiving design. On our roads, this has saved millions and millions of lives. And it is a genius approach. And engineers should be applauded for recognizing that they can design things to adapt to human behavior. The problem is, is that when we get into our streets, this kind of design is dangerous. It does not adapt to our human behavior. In fact, it does the opposite. It takes drivers and it licenses them to drive more quickly. It licenses them to speed because it signals to them that, hey, we've taken care of all the problems. You don't have to worry. We've created all this buffer room for you. When we bring forgiving design principles into our streets, we're doing a disservice to our neighborhoods and we're creating places that are dangerous. Th this is a standard kind of chart you see in engineering manuals. This idea that there's a trade-off between mobility and access. Remember we talked about the hierarchical road network? Here it is. Locals, collectors, arterials. If you're an arterial, you've got lots of mobility, but not very much access. There's not going to be very much stuff there. 
If you're on a local street, you've got lots of access, but we're gonna limit mobility, and that makes a lot of sense, right? We all get that. But here in engineer land, there's this kind of utopia where you can have your cake and eat it too. You can go somewhere and be somewhere simultaneously. It's this collector spot in the middle, right? If you take that chart and you flip it on its side and say, okay, speed, and in the vertical, again, I'm sorry I like charts, uh, value, what this chart is asking is what, at what speed does our transportation system create the greatest amount of value? And the answer to that is when we are on a road and going at very high speeds, we're providing a lot of value for our dollar in transportation. When we are on a street and we are going at very slow speeds, we can create great neighborhoods and great places that build lots of wealth and lots of prosperity for our community. But it's that middle zone, that middle area, that area that we call the strode uh, that is so damaging. Um, a strode is, Hayden, a street road hybrid. We call this the futon of transportation. <laughs> so if you think of the futon as an uncomfortable couch that makes into an uncomfortable bed, a strode tries to do two things at once and it fails at both. It tries to move vehicles quickly, like a road, and it tries to create a place like a street. This is like the quintessential strode. In this location here is a strode. Texas is like 98% strodes. Right? You know, once you get off the highways, and even the highways have a little bit of strodiness to them, but you know, you, you look at this, and what you've got is you've got four highway scaled lanes, you've got a center turn lane, all that is designed to move cars very, very quickly. No cars get to move quickly here, right? You, you have a, a, a signal that makes you go zero miles an hour, uh, you've got limited speeds here. So even though we've made a massive investment in capacity and moving quickly, no one gets to move quickly. This street that we drove in on out here today, we, we, Constitution, is that what we were? No, 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 the one we were on at lunch today that we were talking about. Congress, Congress, South Congress. I mean, come on, people. Uh, what are you trying to do there? Are you actually trying to have nice restaurants and nice places and nice neighborhoods? Or are you trying to just have a drag strip, right? It, it, it conflicts, and the reality is, is that that's a nasty strode, but nobody gets to move very quickly through there. Simultaneously, you have done miracles along South Congress with your development pattern. You've squeezed the most value you can next to that nasty strode, right? Like, it is really, really nice for what you've been given. It's not very nice, right? Like, I mean, it could be so much nicer if that street was actually a street with cars driving slowly, uh, actual humanity being able to go back and forth. It would be amazing. I mean, you would, you would fall in love with it. It would be gorgeous. You've extracted as much value as you can, but the street keeps that value from growing. I'm sorry, the strode uh, keeps that value from growing. We need to have a conversation about how we convert our strodes into great streets and great roads. This is super, super easy super easy to do. It is much harder conceptually to get our minds around. And this is why I think the CNU conversation here is so important. If you're not involved in CNU, get involved because this is the group that is, is changing the language about how we talk about these things, right? Because this is a cultural shift. If we wanna go from street, strode to street, it's really easy. Step number one, slow traffic. Tighten up the lanes, create some edge friction, lower speed limits, slow everything down. Step number two, prioritize people outside of a vehicle over the throughput of traffic. You can't actually build a place if there's stuff running through it all the time. You actually have to build a place. Step number three, build a place. Intensify adjacent land use. That's a geeky way of saying just build stuff, right? Like if you want to thicken up your neighborhoods, you got to go out and build stuff and then embrace the complexity. Uh, don't be such sticklers on rules and regulations that you actually gotta have a little bit of messiness to make places like this work. To go the opposite way is just as easy. Limit access. Uh, separate your automobiles from everything else. You, if you want a bike on a road, 
you, that's great, have a separate facility. Because you can't safely bike next to someone driving 50, 60, 70 miles an hour. It just can't be done. Separate facility, that's great. Uh, don't allow your adjacent land use to degrade your capacity. Don't try to build stuff along it. This is about moving people places. I am astounded because it seems like your goal as a state is to have one continuous frontage road between Austin and San Antonio. Like, I don't get it. Do you not have enough Schlotzkys, you know? <laughs> it's just this recurring mix of the same, that, that's the kinetic growth machine, right? It just replicates over and over. It creates that kinetic growth. I, I, I want you to focus on the neighborhood level again because we do have the power to change this. We have the capacity within our communities to actually do something fundamentally different, regardless of what the federal government does with transportation, regardless even of what the state DOT is going to do. We have the capacity to do something different. And it starts with understanding the values that are being applied uh, every day to our transportation system. When engineers go and do a design of a street, they have a very simple process that they use. The first thing they do is they say, what is the design speed that we plan to use. They then will say, what is the volume of traffic that we are expected to handle? Starting with those two things, they will then go to the design manual and say, given the speed and the volume, what is a safe design? And then finally, how much is that going to cost? These four priorities, these four values, are the ones that engineers apply to their design process. And they apply them in this order, right? Uh, it is uh, a, 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 a hierarchical order that uh, you know places in the process of design uh, one above the other. These are we can think of them as the engineer's priorities, right? This is my street. This is where I live. I'm going home tomorrow. Uh, I have two little girls who texted me today and said, we miss you, Dad. Um, they're not used to Dad being gone because we've had a pandemic and I've been home with them for two years. Um, this is my sidewalk right here. This is my street. It's lovely. I, I, I feel very fortunate. I live in a, a very nice historic neighborhood in central Brainerd. Uh, the original plat. My house was built in 1914. By the way, I love Austin. You guys are it's very nice here. Um, if you want to move to my neighborhood, you can get a gorgeous house about five blocks from the nice downtown uh, for like $200,000, so. Um, yeah, and we have, and people complain about how high housing prices are. Um, so here's the priorities of the engineer as they manifest in the design process. I want you to think about the street where you live, your street, and I wanna ask you, which of these values would you prioritize? I'm going to ask you to all say at the same time what you would. I, I, I want you to think, you know, as I'm thinking about my street, do I want to make sure that vehicles can travel at speed? Do I want to make sure that we're accommodating a certain volume of vehicles? Do I want to make sure that what we build is safe? Or do I want to make sure that it is cost effective? If you had to prioritize for your street, would you choose speed, volume, safety, or cost? Safety. All right. If you had to choose between these last three, would you be a priority for you to move cars at speed, move a high volume of vehicles, or would you want your investments to be cost effective? Would you say speed, volume, or cost? cost. In a choice between speed and volume, if you had to choose which one you're going to prioritize, would it be a higher priority that you'd be able to move cars at speed or that you'd be able to move a certain volume of cars? Would you pick speed or volume? volume. I can't change these, right? <laughs> do, do you see what you've done here? Do you see what you've done? We have to embrace this as a power that we have to do something fundamentally different, to demand that a different set of values are applied to our neighborhoods. So I'm gonna leave you with three quick things that, that we can do right now 
to start making Austin a stronger town. The, the first one, all these are very simple uh, to say, harder to do, it's okay? That's why we got you guys. You guys are like the shock troops out there pushing things on the front lines. We need to allow everywhere the next development increment by right. Um, for those of you who are not planning and zoning geeks, um, let me just explain the term by right. By right means you can go into City Hall at 9 a.m. with a completed permit application, walk out by noon with a permit, and start building. You, you don't have to go to endless meetings. You don't have to genuflect in front of a council. You don't have to go ask permission from your neighbors. In every neighborhood in Austin, you should be able to reach that next level of development intensity with no friction at all. Let me give you a concrete example of this. If you have a neighborhood of single family homes, there should be nothing from a regulatory standpoint that prevents that neighborhood from evolving over a generation into a neighborhood of duplexes. Nothing at all. Now, along with this, we have a, 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 something we say at Strong Towns that uh, is very, very important and goes along with this notion. Uh, it, it's, it's this idea here. As we think about our neighborhoods, no neighborhood should experience radical change. But no neighborhood can be exempt from change. A lot of times what we do is we say, okay, we're gonna keep all the city locked under glass. We're gonna have it frozen in regulatory amber. Nothing will change. But this one neighborhood over here, where there's enough developer interest, or where there's enough poor people, or whatever it is, we're gonna focus on that neighborhood, and that neighborhood's gonna get all the radical change. No one should leave a neighborhood, come back a decade later, and not be able to recognize the place they left. We need our neighborhoods to thicken up. Remember that congestion diagram and how we solve uh, hydrology 101. It's the same as how we solve traffic 101. We start to build neighborhoods, we start to thicken up. We create corner stores, we create duplexes. We take our existing framework, and instead of allowing it to sit in stasis when it goes into that failure, we actually allow people to invest in their homes, make something of it, and have that wealth really accumulate across a broad area. We also simultaneously need to lower the bar of entry. Uh, this is so hard because uh, we are affluent. Uh, there's all this money pouring into the city of, of, of Austin, and sometimes this seems like a, a, an afterthought, like a silly thing. But it is so important that we find ways for everyone to participate in the city that we're building. Let me give you a couple examples. Um, this is something that in my city we call a tiny house. Our ancestors would have called this a house, right? We have added the word tiny to it and, and, and put on all these extra regulations for what is really just a starter home. People for thousands of years built starter homes. They started out cheap, they started out small. When they had a kid, they would put an addition on the back. When they had another one, they put a second story on. The neighbor would come over and help them. They'd go help their neighbor. We have prohibited these kind of developments. We, we, we have the family who has the house, and the house uh, has a leaky roof, and they don't have the money to fix the roof. It's a very common situation. If we go back 100 years, that was easily solvable, right? Because what they would do is they would say, I'm gonna take this spare bedroom we have, and I'm gonna put a door on it to the outside and a little kitchenette and I'm gonna rent it out as an apartment. And I'm gonna use the revenue from that to fix the roof. And so I've thickened up the neighborhood, I've added some value to my home, I've created a cash stream for myself, and I've been able to stay in my house and maintain it. What are we gonna to do today? Nothing. Let your roof fall apart. Let your house go to hell. And eventually someone will buy it if it's in a growing neighborhood and, and tear it down and build a nice big McMansion but we don't allow you to stay there and make better use of it. Those things need to change. There's the same opportunity in a commercial standpoint. Uh, today, if you wanna start a commercial business, if you're an entrepreneur, there's a certain process you can go through to get into a building, meet the building code, have all, you know. Uh, and if you talk to entrepreneurs, what we find is that America likes to think of itself, and Texas in particular, as like the home of the self-starter, right? The bootstrapper, the entrepreneur, but the reality is, is you have to have money to get in this game now. This is Muskegon, Michigan. Muskegon, Michigan recognized that they had a lot of entrepreneurs in their community, but no place for them to get started. 
They went out and bought a bunch of storage sheds. They painted them up funky colors. They put them out in a gap they had in the streetscape, and they rent them out at ridiculously low prices to entrepreneurs, people who are trying to figure out a business model to be of service to their neighbors. And the fascinating thing is that people come in here, they try stuff, fails all the time. But a lot of it eventually works. They figure out what to do. They figure out in a very low stakes environment how to have a business that works. Muskegon, Michigan is a poor deindustrialized city. They are a hub of innovation and entrepreneurship. We look at Austin as a hub of entrepreneurship. Why? Because there's billions of investor, you know, venture capital being flooded into your market. Okay? That's great. We can call those people entrepreneurs. We can call them investors. That's very different than the very bottom up type of thing that we need to renew our neighborhoods and make them great places. The last thing that I want to give you is, is this. When we think about the big infrastructure spending bills that we're doing and the way that we try to solve every problem as a transportation problem, we need to recognize that we have built cities uh, that, that create a lot of difficulty for a lot of people. And if we want our neighborhoods to thicken up, if we want them to become more prosperous, if we want them to become great places, uh, we have to actually have a different approach to making public investments. I started off this whole thing by saying, you should build nowhere highway lanes. You shouldn't. I'll tell you what else you shouldn't build. You shouldn't build any more streets, any more roads, you shouldn't build any more pipes, none of that. You've got way more than you can maintain today. What we need to do is start focusing our public investments on answering this question. How, do how are people struggling right now to make use of the city? At Strong Towns, we've created a four-step process to work through how you would make great public investments. Step number one, go out and humbly observe where people struggle. With humility, so in other words, you don't know the answer already, you're gonna go out and learn. Go out and observe, experience the community the way people in the community experience it. Where do people struggle day in and day out to make use of the city as it has been built? Step number two, ask yourself a question. What is the next smallest thing we can do right now to address that struggle? Notice I didn't say, you know, what is the grant we can get to fix this forever? What's the big project we can do? Uh, you know, what, what's the ultimate thing here? Ask the question, what is the thing we can do with straw bales and duct tape and, and cones to make this problem that we see, this struggle that we see, a little bit easier? Step number three, do that thing. Do that thing right now. Don't form a committee. Don't study it for six months. Don't send it to the bureaucracy. It's a small little thing. Go out and do it. Do it right now. Make life better for someone. And this is step number four. Repeat that process over and over and over. Jane Jacobs called cities a co-creation, something we build together. We have transformed cities into something that we pay someone else to provide to us. And one of the reasons why our cities have lost dynamism in their core neighborhoods is because we treat it like a, a service that is being provided, as opposed to something that we build together. Our city bureaucracies need to humble themselves to go out and actually observe where people struggle and respond to that. And we do our part by responding to that, by actually living and existing in these neighborhoods and helping identify where those struggles are so that we can iterate incrementally to something much better. We have the opportunity right now to make small, uh, I, I don't want to say small as in size, low cost, high returning investments that build real wealth in our neighborhoods for the community as a whole, for individuals throughout them, while also improving dramatically the quality of life of people in the city. We could do that with the resources we have, and we'll be wildly successful with it and build an amazing, amazing place. That, that in essence, is the Strong Towns approach. Um, I have to apologize because the, the real estate people were very voracious on the book and bought all of them but two. We had a huge stack. So I only have two books up here. Um, Sheena can get you if you want to buy either the book that we have here, uh, the one that's already out, or if you want to buy the new one, uh, she can get you hooked up with that and we will send it to you and we'll sign it and do all that stuff. 
Um, you can also get it at any local bookstore or anywhere that books are sold. Uh, September 8th is when the next one comes out. I, I just want to say thank you for having me here today. Uh, this has been wonderful. I always love the opportunity to meet with my CNU friends. And if you are not part of the local CNU chapter, uh, all of the innovative stuff that you're hearing, almost all of it is coming from a, a dedicated group of people uh, that are in CNU or adjacent to CNU. And if you want to be a part of this conversation in Austin and where you're at, uh, get, get, get with them. Get with the local group, get with the national group, and uh, be part of that conversation. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.